Hello and welcome back to another episode of Supercoach Insider. My name is Ben. And I'm Swizz. And thank you for joining us. We are heading into round eight, ladies and gentlemen, getting in towards the tricky part of the season. Do you start smashing out the upgrades? Do you start storing cash aside like Chris is at the moment? Chris not here. Swizz, it's his birthday, so we can give him a little bit of an excuse. I'd like to think that he just doesn't want to show up and pay me my money. Um, I'll tell you what, if he doesn't show up tomorrow, I'm going to have to go break his kneecaps. Birthday or no birthday, <laughs> this guy owes me money. Fremantle won six games out of seven. He now owes me. I cannot be happier, Swizz. <laughs> and we said Fremantle had an easy run. I was not expecting them to be this good. How are you today? Mate, I was expecting them to be that good. I thought that was going to be fantastic. Mate, I am good back at work after a couple months off. So flying around and that. Had, had an awesome day today. Went down to the beach. Fucking yep. Shout out to those sponsors and stuff like that. But mate, no, no we're good. Played some rounds of golf as well this morning. So um, oh. that was good, mate. So I'm, I'm, I'm flying at the moment. And unfortunately, the only thing that isn't flying is my buddy Supercoach Classic team. But I'm a draft player now. Let's go with all the draft because my keeper leagues and draft leagues are fucking flying, mate. And uh, for all those who listen to me on Supercoach Classic, uh, do as I say, not as I do, because all the advice I'm giving out seems to be working. I just don't take my own fucking advice. So it's a bit of a problem, but let's continue to help everyone else. I think that's that's the funny part because even then I did my team um, you know, podcast last week and I spoke about my team and I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And I was like, or I could do it this way. And I pretty much, well, I won't say it's a wrong choice, but I cost myself, I wasn't expecting Parker to go absolutely gangbusters. I thought I had maybe a week, get some cash in roses and – Cost me 100 points there. So, uh, yes, shout out to splashvodka.com.au for this lovely beverage. I've also got one, a sneaky one for a little bit later, the Keiju Crush, just because I like to party and double down. It was my birthday on the weekend as well, so thank you for all the love and the shout outs there. Um, also, earnu.io, go check them out as well. I, th- I won. I played it safe this week, Swizz. I think I went just a few simple bets, the Ds to win, West Coast to uh, Richmond to win, so West Coast to lose. And it was like another simple one that was pretty much a shoe in um, just to get my $2 rods and get myself 100 crypto. So uh, I couldn't deal with it, mate. Three losses in a row. So I'm like, you know what? Uh, I'll do the, I'll pulse out and I'll go the simple option. Kane Corns actually, as well, is now doing his tips as well with uh, Earn You. So check that out if you like Kane Corns. Um, which which not many Victorians do. And no, bit, but, like, um, but look, hey, he, they got him on board. They got, uh, only you got him on board. Yeah. So Kane Corns is doing out his tips and getting uh, some free crypto bets for the community. So we have a new sponsor next week, ladies and gentlemen, that we are really excited about. I'm not going to give too much away just yet, but I got my package in the mail today. Um, speaking of sponsors real quick, we won't waste too much of your time, ladies and gentlemen, but basically um, if you like what we do, it takes time effort, right? So Chris and myself, I think we're down about $2,000 over the first four years, which we do it because it's a hobby, right? We get that. And we don't expect to take money out of every person that comes along. Sponsors are nice because at the moment, we're kind of at a period where YouTube can give us a little bit of money and people actually want to sponsor us. Now, this one particularly is good because it's marketed towards the fact that we have 99% of our listeners uh, and people that watch us on YouTube are male, and they're also between the age group of 18 to 40, which is pretty much a perfect time. So we've got a nice little trial. We'll tell you about it next week for a new sponsorship, and we've got a one month, so hopefully it kicks off. So if you do like us, the way you can support us is by supporting these other platforms. If you're already interested in the shit they're selling, then get amongst it, and then that way they might actually give us a financial incentive monthly to keep sponsoring their shit. But that's how it goes. I'm actually really excited. There's some stuff in there, which I'll talk about next week, but there's some stuff in there. I'm like, what the fuck is this? I'm like, this looks pretty cool. And it's generally the kind of thing that we use anyway. So I'm actually really excited about it. Um, Swizz, what's your initial thoughts? Well, well, I was going to say one last one on that sponsorship, and they don't sponsor us, but they sponsor me personally for the Cricket Club. House of Bobbins, Mother's Day coming up. Yes. Um, Yeah, a a good friend of mine has her own business, House of Bobbins, does a lot of knickknacks and stuff like that. So, you know, for your mum or your grandma out there, just check them out and that you might find something that you can give them for Mother's Day. And shout out to everyone's mother out there because, you know, it's obviously a big day for them on Sunday. Yep, and if you don't shout out your mum, Swizz will do it for you. Hey, Swizz. <laughs> um, what is it? House, no comment, <laughs> House of Bobbins? Yeah, House of Bobbins is my friend's um, online business. House of so. Bobbins. Yeah. So. How do you spell that? Uh, B-O-B-B-I-N-S. 
All right, there you go. I'm going to have to check that out because I, geez, we have gotten off topic. I need to do a better job for Mother's Day this year because last year I was like, yeah, like that's fine. I bought my missus a present and whatever have you. And then she was seeing her mom. I was like, well, you're taking too long. So I went to the shops for a couple of hours and it turns out I shut the bed and she wasn't happy. This year she's working Mother's Day. She's like, well, it can't be worse than last year. So I really need to kind of pull my finger out and do her. So if you have any suggestions, please do help me out. Help a brother out because I need to, I need some help, everyone. Well, I'll have to give you some help because, mate, I'm the present king. My, my, I spoil my wife with stuff and she's not even a mother at the moment. So, you know, <laughs> wait until that happens. Well, hopefully that happens. I refrain going to be buddy presents flying here what an introduction the final yep. thing sc insider 100 you can find yes. us on facebook twitter and twitch uh also all the audio platforms as well spotify soundcloud stitcher you name it all the audio love as well the words getting around ladies and gentlemen and please do like subscribe i think at the moment on youtube particularly like subscribe put on notifications so that way you get notified when swizz does his team release when i do my team release when chris gets his shit together and gets his stuff online as well you can get notified and uh, we try and do our own little bits and pieces and takes come together in a nice little unit, um, which is also what I've got a bit going on downstairs is my nice little unit there, Swiss. Mm -hmm. um, talking about this week now, so moving on, what we want to do is we want to talk about the rookies because there is a little bit of conundrum. Do you move this week? Do you go early on people next week? Because there's only so much room. And especially if you're upgrading, you can really only pick up one or two rookies a week at this moment um, to kind of make some moves. So it's who do we think are the ones that are probably looking the goods? Who are we kind of leaving behind? And also the strategy that moves in towards premiums because at the moment it's like, well, do you go for the value picks? And we're talking about premiums that have fallen in price a little bit and they're ripe for the picking. I mean actual premiums, not Jake Lloyd who's dropped off a fucking cliff. <laughs> or do you pay up? Do you pay the 600000 for Stuart? Do you pay – um Mills who's 678k right so between Mills and say Petraka there's like $108,000 difference so where's the strategy come in so that's what we're kind of <clears> thinking <throat> of for today giving you those sorts of thoughts and that should actually really well prepare you for going in towards the buy rounds because the buy round is going to be anarchy you just save some of those boosted things and it's just going to be literally like go 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 wonderful this rookie's in get on the field and premiums let's go like shuffle 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 um, so I suggest you save some boosts for that. Speaking of boosts, let's go with the rookies first, Swizz. Now, the first one who was pretty much the highest earner or potential earner for this week was, what do you call him, Swizz? <laughs> Straddle Dick. <laughs> uh, Stranatica from the West Coast Eagles. Now, good news is if you were considering him, you have a week to sit on it uh, at least because he has entered health and safety protocols, which kind of changes the thinking around Dixon a little bit because Dixon was someone who I was looking to move out this week. I still might, but it looks like Dixon is the number one ruck at West Coast, which increases his likelihood of maybe going even close to an 80 or at least breaking the eight, uh, the break even. So it could kind of mini restart his cash generation again. Swizz, where do you stand on that as far as Dixon? Yeah, so I know like Chris was talking to me about this because Chris is in the situation where Dixon is his R3, didn't jump on Sam Hayes. So for him, it's a perfect result because, as you said, Dixon plays first ruck. Um, he gets another week uh, before he needs to bring Straddle Dick in and, um, you know, obviously that's a downgrade. The issue for me and quite a few other people who are running Proust into Sam Hayes, um, obviously we don't really have that option at the moment, but... Um, with Sam Hayes scoring, like, what did he score on the weekend? 50-something, I think it was? 53, yeah. 53. So, obviously, that, you know, he, he did make 70,000 cash on the weekend, projected to go up another 50,000 this week. Um, so, he makes 120 k Now, in a perfect world, I'd like to keep Hayes because he's still going to probably have another 100 after that, but it'll be more of a slow burn because of that 53, especially if he was to come in and score less this week. Um and we're trying to find out a bit more word, news around sort of Charlie Dixon. I think he's about two weeks away, though. Charlie Dixon's more going to play forward. But there yeah. is that option that they could look at putting, putting West off into the ruck um, if Hayes was to, you know, get beaten up again. Um, you say so, West off in the ruck? Not West off, sorry. Um, <laughs> Finlayson, yeah, fucking West off. Oh, no, I was going to say, well, West off coming he's, back from yeah, the no, break. <laughs> That is a real disservice to to um, <laughs> off. probably need him back and get instead of fucking. They do, um, um, Dixon. But yeah, so that that's that's sort of the thought where you could possibly go 
well, now that he's in COVID protocols for a normal week, maybe just take the cash of 120k Hayes has made and then bring him in. It might be an option for people next week if they um they need the money to do an upgrade. But so that probably does give us just a little bit of an extra option come next week with those rucks. So um, yeah, I don't mind it. Yeah, Dixon Dixon's playing Sample this weekend, I believe. So yeah. he'll, he'll get some managed minutes in. Um, I can't see them rushing him back in, so I think it'll probably be yeah, maybe a couple of weeks in, manage those minutes, and then throw him to the Wolves. So there is one there. Moving on, next one is uh, probably the one of the most relevant ones for this week. Um, Paul Curtis on the bubble. Uh, he's one hundred seventeen thousand dollar forward only, which is kind of painful because I prefer it if he was a forward mid to give you a little bit of flexibility. Um, Roses was the same forward only. It's kind of a bit painful. Uh, projected, he got 58. He's averaging 58. He's gone 58 twice on the nose. The issue for me is is that, well, number one, he probably looks like he's a, one of the better rookies this week and forward options. So I don't mind him too much because you feel like he's actually one of the only ones that looks lively at North Melbourne. But again, he plays for North Melbourne. So even you know when you have a look at these midfielders or even the forwards, it's like they're not playing well which means they're not getting much of the pie and it makes it harder. So it's this weird kind of scenario where you want rookies playing or playing for crap clubs because then they get a better go, but then these other clubs are just getting flogged so they don't get much points anyway, which is, you know, unless you're a Greg Clark. Swiss, what do you think on uh, Curtis? So as I said last week, I saw him that first game and I thought he looked probably North Melbourne's best option up forward. Um, Yeah, really lively, got into the right positions. Again, the problem was any other team in that situation probably gets an 80 because, um, you know, the ball's down there much a lot more. I saw none of the game on the weekend. I was at the Blackburn Hotel. We were watching the St. Kilda Port Adelaide game. I've never seen so many people in a pub nearly fall asleep watching a fucking game of footy. So unfortunately, I can't comment. But it looks like he's got similar stat line um, from his first game. So I think it's the same situation, and that's why he's scoring 58 because he's good enough to find it, gets on the end and kicks a goal, but North Melbourne just don't get the ball down enough to hurt. So he's probably going to be that guy between 50 and 60, um, and I just don't like it compared to other options. Though, No. if that's, you know, you kind of needed a forward option, it's not terrible if you kind of bypassed on Roses that a few people did because they were thinking maybe Dempsey, which is just gone now. Um, Curtis isn't a terrible option, but I just, yeah, I'm not 100% sold on that. Yeah, I'm with you. I think if you need the cash to get an upgrade and you need a forward, then I think Curtis is probably your one for this week. Uh, the forwards from next week, which we'll get into, I think their sample size is smaller, so there'd be definitely a lot more risk in that. My only concern is, again, is if Curtis, he, you know, playing in a forward line for that team, he could easily just break out a crappy score one week and just absolutely nullify it. At least if a rookie comes out and has at least a good score in that first two rounds, you know you're going to get some cash. Even if they kind of tailor off and get you some more 50s and 60s, the fact that he's gone 58 58, it's okay. Uh, I don't mind it, which is way better than Dempsey. Now, I it's funny because I was going, I was gonna hold off on Roses to get two premiums last week, which I'll get into my team pod. Kind of fucked up because I didn't get Luke Parker. But um Dempsey, the reason I got in Roses is because Dempsey did so bad. It's literally he got 12. 12 super coach. Fremont had a whole lot of contributors. Um, and it's you know, it's Nothing against Dempsey, obviously a young player and all the rest of it. Fremantle are pretty well knitted in their defensive line, but definitely you can rule him out now. Um, job security was already a bit shaky. Now you've got that 12 in his cycle as well. Um, yeah, basically projected to go up 25,000 and then 7,000 the week mm-hmm. after. So I think you can definitely avoid uh, and pass up on that one. And the last one's probably Robbie McComb Swizz. Yeah. Your yeah, your boy, mid, is it? Yeah, his midfield. Um, it was, uh, yeah, he played a great game. He got that sort of half-forward wing role, which because Lockie Hunter's out of the side, um, you know, Vermont boy, and local footy used to kill it, just find, found it at ease. We saw his numbers at VFL, found it at ease. The issue is that the Bulldogs, they've got so many midfielders, it's really hard to get that piece of the pie and, and rack up that many positions. But on the, the flip side of that, the way the dogs play, um, they do rack up a lot of the ball. And, um, yeah, they were um, looking for him off that half-forward flank. So he's not a terrible option, especially because some of the games the Bulldogs still have to come up, um, and especially the next couple of weeks. 
Uh, so I don't mind him, 102K. Um, you could go a lot worse than Robbie McComb. I think he's definitely got a role in there. The problem with those, those sort of guys and the amount of players the Bulldogs to have in depth is, you know, it could be one or two bad games and you can find yourself out. Um, but we saw last year with McNeil and Scott, especially McNeil keeping his spot this year, Bevo is happy to back in some of those younger players. Um, so, yeah, it's quite possible that he actually keeps his job security for quite a while. Yep, I think that's fair enough. Um, he's someone that I am considering, but I think the big issue is that it looks like there's probably two better midfielders on the bubble next week, which kind of puts the squeeze on him a little bit. Um, again, I don't mind him too much. It's just one of those hit and hopes. It's kind of like I remember Sydney Stack, you know, it was one of those ones where like Chris is like, oh, $102,000 midfielder or whatever. Job security is pretty crappy. And then next minute just starts banging out some 80s. Do you know what I mean? It's one of those ones and then you just get absolutely blessed with a $200,000 profit. It, it, it's got that kind of feel on it for me. It, hit and hope if you like. But um, He's I just, mature yeah. age, so that's that's the yeah. one thing there as well. We've seen with Nick Martin, you know, those mature age guys come in, they, they're they more ready to ha- handle, you know, the r- rigorous AFL system, you know, the backing up of games and, and just the way they're played out. So... Um, and, and there's a lot of want there from him. You can see how determined he is to make it. Uh, so for 102K, as, as I said, you could do worse. Um, the probably issue is just a couple of the other guys that are uh, coming up on the bubble and how many that you need or how many will you want to fit into your side um, because we haven't talked about Greg Clark and Carol from Carlton. Um, yeah, so, they're the two that I probably so, prefer over him. Yep. But I will touch on just quickly with McComb is that Port Adelaide this week probably poses as the biggest test for the dogs and particularly then for him because if you're winning, everything's easy. If you win, basically, usually most of the time you kind of keep your spot. But, you know, if if, um, there's not really much internal changes or anything like that, you kind of keep your spot a little bit easier. Port Adelaide this week, then you've got Collingwood who I think the dogs should probably be able to get over them. I know it's – should um, Adelaide beat them, but – you have a look at it, and then after that, you've got Gold Coast, who the dogs should beat, and then West Coast Eagles. So if they – two teams that they should beat after that. So I think it could open up and he could, you know, still get away and get some of those 63s and maybe even a 70 or an 80 if things get a bit of a roll on, particularly that West Coast region. West Coast in round 11, this is hypothetical, best-case scenario. You've got West Coast in round 11, then they play Geelong, which is a hard team, and then they've got the bye. So he could go on a nice little run of, you know, four four games, five games, and then cut. Literally on their buy, upgrade, and away you go. And hopefully he's made you one hundred hundred and fifty thousand dollars cash. Uh, is definitely possible, Swiss. Yeah, definitely is. Next, well, let's go have a look. The big man, Greg Clark. Some people moved early. Um, I wasn't opposed to moving early, but it's one of those ones where, you know, unless you unless you're playing him on field or you're looping him with, you know, you have loophole option. You want to sort of put the E on him, and if he goes well, you can take it. If you needed that security at your M8, then yeah, cool, go for it. But generally I don't like to move too early on players because I had to, I think I had like, was it coming, went well one week, I went early and he did horrible the next thing, got dropped and never came back into the side and I'm just sitting there like looking at him going, oh, what's going on here? Or they get injured. Coming right? early or they is always get, a problem, mate. Well, they get suspended. I mean, have a look at Bruce, right? People brought him in early and they're like, yeah, Bruce got me 100, suspended. Oh, crap, sit on him for a week. You know, it's one of those ones where at least – you know what their break even is. You at least know what they've scored, and you can take all of the data without having a stab in the dark. Now, sometimes when you stab in the dark, you come up with a winner. You open up, you turn the lights on, you've got a six foot, six foot two blonde in front of you, and it's like yeah. Other times you stab in the dark, and you're like, what the hell was I picking up at the late night sushi train? So, hit and hope. I'm glad your wife doesn't listen to this, mate. <laughs> hit and hope, mate. Well, mate, I'm just, in the I'm, dark. I'm just shaking my head because in my team pod, I had Clark in all week. Um, this is my th- like three disastrous decisions. I had Clark, I was loopholing him, and because Rosas was named, I took him out um, because I'm like, well, oh, I need that one rookie, and Clark, I've still got two weeks to look at. Rosas is now, so let's do that. And naturally, that meant keeping Horn Francis for another week, who just continues to hang around in my side. He's fucking off this week. Um, His break so, yeah, even's like, lower this week, though. Yeah, so, so that co- that cost yeah. me 50 points there on field. Um, bit frustrating, but yeah, those who went early, fantastic. There was 
Ah, oh, fucking Abdul too. Every week, fucking Abdul. You're doing well, buddy. I know you listen to the show and does a great job actually shouting us out on the Richmond forums for questions and, uh, and, and you know, great banter. But he messaged me last week. He brought Clark in, loopholed him, and asked me which player he needed to take off on his bench. And I think his M6, 7, and 8 were Tom Green, Petrarca, and Bailey Smith. And I was like, you can get fucked because if you've got bloody 100 on your bench and that and you've already got eight primos in the midfield, I don't want to fucking talk to you right now. Um, so, yeah, right. Yeah, that's no, uh, pretty good. So, no, Clark looks great, mate. The West Coast are as shit as you can get at the moment. They're, mate, they're terrible and I think worse pain to come. And if you're a West Coast supporter, unfortunately, not only are you crap, but you've got to watch Fremantle probably go through one of their better periods ever and that, and more to come for the Dockers. So, Clark, and Brisbane you know, D's in the next two weeks yes. for our West Coast. So. Clark <laughs> is about their only shining light at the moment. And yeah, as you said, Brisbane and D, so they're going to get absolutely part. If, if we can beat them, we were 115 points up with a minute to go. And obviously they got that last goal. What are buddy Brisbane and Melbourne going to do to this mob? So Clark, mature age guy, found the ball, looked really good. Um, because it's Brisbane and Melbourne, I don't see him going back to back hundreds. I still think he can score very well. Um, but I think the um, West Coast are going to get absolutely trapped the next two weeks. Even then, Simpson came out afterwards saying, you know, he didn't look out of his element, which is probably one of the best compliments a coach can give you in your first game of AFL footy to say, he, you know, you held your own, you look like you're in your element, like you weren't over your head, which is pretty much the biggest compliment you can get in a team that just got flogged. So I think that's probably the silver lining for them. Um, I was actually really impressed with how his, even his work rate and his work ethic, he really did push back hard to try and help out in defense. And let's face it, they needed help in defense. Um, so I do, I do really like that there. Um, Carol is one for me as well. Um, shout out to Carl and a few other uh, Carlton people that I, I speak to, basically saying he's best 22. He was he had such a good preseason and he was already brink on the best 22 at that point in time. That's the first part. I think he had a little bit of a um, – was it a calf or a little bit of a niggle or something that kind of set him back a little bit. And now he's pretty much in the fold where he looks extremely good. I think he had that wing position all sewn up. Carlton also have a huge list of injuries. I don't know if you've seen their, their injury list, but it's absolutely massive. Um, the Carlton people that I talked to are pretty much saying he's best 22, he won't leave that side, which means that pretty much for me, I think you know Greg and Carol, who both look really good, both look like they're going to make a lot of cash, are pretty much perfectly timing their year to get into our sides. What do you reckon? Yeah, and they are, and this was the discussion about McComb before. So, what are we looking at? We've got War, some have Ward, McGuinness, McDonald still floating around that midfield, Horn Francis, who else? Probably Berry, um, Mead. Mead. So, it depends on how many you want to downgrade. Like, you could possibly go McComb this week um, for, say, maybe a Mead type or a, like a McDonald who's probably got one more week left in him anyway, and then go Carroll and Clark, and that could be your bench coming into your buys. Um, and yeah, all of them have the potential to make 150 K if not more and Clark and Carol, especially if they're going to keep their spot in their best 22 and have decent scoring potential, um, could be very handy around the buy periods, um, to sort of cover some of those guys are out. So we, that's always the issue. Um, because even though it's best 18, you want those rookies or you need those bench to cover some of those spots. Um, and unfortunately in previous years, we've had bench players who haven't been there come by time it always seemed to happen they always get dropped for the buys while Clark and Carol in particular look very solid to be players during that time so um, definitely next week it's something I'm looking at both but I've got Clark in there at the moment and I'm just trying to consider do I get McComb this week and go all three of them or if it's just Clark and Carol does it does the job but I think you're going to need at least two of them. Yeah, and the fact that I like about McComb as well, particularly for your mead types, you could bank 100000 If you go a $120,000 player for them, then you don't really make much cash. There is something to note here, particularly the difference between playing standard and going for your league wins. Now, Dixon has more cash to make. He's probably playing Ruck this week. If you're going for league wins, and even possibly overall, you might want to hold on to these players. Horn Francis, he didn't do well, but his break-even's gone down. So to the point where you could probably almost hold him. I think he's still got one of those games to kind of regenerate himself if you need to. So you can kind of hold off some of these players a little bit longer to make sure that they are ripe and that you're not going to get any more cash out of them and then you can move them on. Whereas when you're going overall, you really want to try and flip them. Sometimes you even flip them earlier than you should because you know you're going to get a premium on field and those points on field matter. 
which is pretty much what I was looking at last week. I could afford, I was going to bring in Gorn and Parker last week, and I could afford it. But then I was worried about the forward rookies, et cetera. So then I was like, well, I'll go Roses this week. I had $300,000, and then that way I was going to go one down, two up this week. And I could still do one down, two up this week, which is still good for my overall team. But the issue is that Parker went up 35000 which kind of screws up a lot of the plans. But that is a, a strategy to be seen. Whereas if you're going for overall, sometimes people criticize and they say, oh, but that rookie's got more cash to make. It's like, yeah, but is he going to get me more points than a premium? Because I can go him to a premium right now. I can go to a premium right now, which is points on field right now that other people don't have. So sometimes going for overall, if you're really trying to make a push, you kind of have to be a little bit more aggressive and flip some of these rookies, maybe even earlier than you want to, just because of what you can get now. Um, Swizz, thoughts? Yeah, mate. Um, you talking it's about, tough. It is, mate. That's it. Um, like I'm, I'm looking at value right now with Parker and Crips because I don't have either of them. Um, because I moved Crips at the time thinking there's no doing a hammy before. I know it's never a one week injury. God, what a super human he is. Comes back and smashes out a couple of 130s um, back after a week. So there's value there for those who don't have him. You need to probably get definitely Crips if you haven't got Who'd him. What did you get for Crips as a replacement? Uh, I think it was Doggity at the time. Uh, so he gave you a 120 and an 80 odd, 85. Yeah. And that, which is uh, a bit of a shame. And, and that's probably the thing, talking about value, where I'm getting smashed by people who have just gone all value. Like I'm seeing teams popping up. They've got, uh, you know, Bailey Smith, Tom Green, um, you know, Lipinski, Gresham, um, even the back line. It's like Sicily, who we obviously went Whitfield at the time. Um, yeah, I've still you know, got him. <laughs> and, yeah, but there's, there's a lot of these guys who are kind of, like even what the weekly winner this week, I think had Noah Anderson, who I have in um, AFL fantasy, um, <laughs> and, and he's been doing actually quite well in it because he's and more he gets the ball, but he just doesn't get the like you know the efficiency. Not only that, the weekly winner has Noah Anderson, right? And his team was like, okay, like his team's okay, but he killed it. And he's got Noah Anderson in his team, and he's ranked higher than Chris. <laughs> Chris was like livid. He's like, this guy's got fucking no Anderson. He's still beating me. <laughs> oh, um, classic. So that, the problem is, yeah, some of this, all this value, usually in previous years outside, like we started to see a bit of a trend last year or the changing of the guard with like, you know, we had Impy, Zeebel and Aaron Hall and those sort of guys starting to come in. And this year it's just gone nuts. With And we, and we did talk about the possibility of this happening um, because those players, those rookie players, um, haven't been able to play that much over the last couple of years due to COVID. Um, but the way some of these guys have just taken off and um, and the way they're scoring at the value that they were at was, is just amazing. So, yeah, paying up for the like, I think I paid up for Hall and Doherty and those sort of guys. Um, you know, well done to those who paid up for Stewart last week because that actually paid off. But a lot of the time paying up for the guys for the pr top premiums hasn't been working as much. And those sort of value picks have been really good. And some people have been filling out their teams. Now, the flip yeah, side today, the flip side is those of us who have gone that strategy of going the higher premiums and filling our teams up with them, um, it can very easily turn. And we always say as the season goes on, those players who are more seasoned and have um, and the, the bigger fitness base um, and those ball magnets who, you know, they get the colder weather and they just continue to find the ball, they'll start scoring really well. And, you know, you expect some of those other guys will start to drop out and, and even out. And we saw that with MP last year. He started, you know, sort of going 80s. He will had that drop off later in the year. So the value is good because it does fill up your team and get your um, rookies off the field, which is important at this stage. But at the same time, um, come mid-year, it can be costly because, yeah, your guys might just peter out to like 95 and everyone else has gone up and got those 110, 120 guys. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think we need to touch on, before we go into that strategy on value and who we're looking at as compared to the full price players, uh, we've got a couple more now. First one is, now the good thing is, is that with um, Stranatica <clears throat> getting the um, week off with COVID, uh, is that Aiden Begg as well for Collingwood? He's played one game. Now he's playing forward, but he is a ruck eligible player. Scored well and got an 81 last week for Collingwood. Obviously in a win, looked pretty good. So at least that way you get another week of data. So if you do need a ruck to kind of downgrade or free up cash or even try and be super aggressive with that Hayes kind of transaction, at least you now get to see two 
and have a, a little bit of comparison between two players that have played a couple of games. So that's one. And the other one is Hamilton. Now, ever since the Formula One, I've never really liked the guy named Hamilton, but this guy, Cooper Hamilton, uh, does interest me. He scored a 68. He's a $102,000 mid forward. Looked really nimble. Uh, I'm interested to see. Now, it's a little bit hard to pay too much attention to this because GWS absolutely flogged Adelaide. Um, it's interesting. But again, at basement price, uh, I think you know with the Giants that were losing games, I think they needed a little bit of X factor, and I think they got it. So I'm definitely interested to see a little bit more um, data on this one. Now, they play Geelong this week, so it's a definitely a difficult game. Carlton is a difficult game. Then they've got West Coast Brisbane North, so it kind of opens up for them a little bit there. Um, so I'm interested to see. Swizz, what do you think? Hamilton? I wanted to see another game, as you said. They've absolutely pants Adelaide. Kind of see how it continues to work with Toby up there and, and sort of their whole makeup. Um, it was good, just GWS in general. Um, Toby Green comes back. Um, Kelly goes back full-time midfield and that kind of sorts itself out. The interesting one was Whitfield was getting more up the ground. So I don't know. Yeah, that forward flank. Come, yeah, so I don't know how that affects Hamilton as well um, going forward and and how they kind of structure up there. Um, and, and sometimes with the Giants, it does seem to be, you know, you play that bad game where they have a loss, it's first, you know, first in, next out. Um, so I'm not as confident with him, but you never know. If he comes out and does it really well again this week, well, that could change my mind. Yeah, and I think he is an interesting one. Um, Whitfield definitely played more forward flank, kicked three goals, and I think they were saying that they struggled to kind of go from that defensive line into the forward line effectively. Um, so I think that kind of helped having Whitfield sort of in that mix and being able to actually deliver that going forward. So it's one of those ones to watch. Not sure I like Whitfield being forward, but you know, I guess we'll see as to what it's actually happens. from a so. footy point of view for the Giants where he can be more effective. But from a super coach point, no, like it, then he's now relying on kicking goals. So he's kicked three for 95. So if that's a one goal game, he's only getting 60. Um, so Hamilton was actually playing defense and had 84% of his possessions in the back half oh, with. So I think that kind of opens it up a little bit. I did think he wasn't playing, like I no, thought he wasn't it. playing forward. Yeah, so I, just no, I to thought check. I saw him name forward, but I, I saw absolutely none oh. of that game. I was playing body cricket on the week on Saturday. No, so. you're right, mate. So five, <laughs> five tackles, um, quite a few one percenters. So I think it was really bringing the energy, um, 17 pressure acts, didn't really get many meters gains, but still played 102 minutes, which isn't bad for a first game like sort that. of player. So, so so that's because, so that's why they've moved Whitfield for, um, because they brought him into the back line to pressure, which is release Whitfield to go up forward. And I think they're pretty much going to keep with that at this point in time. All the commentators as well have been talking about, oh, how much better they looked going forward and all of the different pieces working together and how Whitfield was good. But I still think Whitfield's probably only like a 90 average forward, if that's so I kind of hate having him on my side, but that's a debate for another day. And the last one is uh, your boy, Maurice Rioli Swiss. Now, you've had a look at previous year's data and having a track of him over the last sort of year or so. What do you think about Rioli, Master? No. Straight off, no. Um, you know, I, I love the love the energy he brought in. You know, how can you not love the Riolis and that? And, you know, but we played West Coast for starters. Um, like, you're not going to get a, any more of an easier kill than what we did on the weekend. He plays small forward. Yes, it's pressure forward and they get tackles and stuff. But at least with Roses, he does get up at the ground a bit. I'm not expecting that with Morris Rioli. So it's just a flat no. Yeah, right. Um, but last year, um, he didn't get many touches in the VFL, did he? But then he kind of transitioned a little bit to get 19s and 20s. Is that what you were telling me well, today? Uh, yeah, but the thing is, still it is, it's like in the VFL, like you can rack them up more. The, the good players rack them up. But it's that gap between, you know, going from the VFL to the AFL and the difference between going to the AFL where you might, or the VFL where you might be able to push up and play wing or play up in the midfield because you're an AFL listed player. But then when you're a legitimate small forward in the AFL system. Um, yeah, no good. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And I saw him miss a goal. I think it was from, didn't make the distance from 40 metres out. And yeah. uh, after that, I kind of tuned out, to be honest, of the, the West Coast. Man, that was a horrible Friday night footy game. I tell you what. Brilliant, mate. Um, we should have more often. Oh, on that, oh. how's the AFL, the floating fixture? Oh, we need this for media thing. And then they put three fucking games with Essendon, including I think it's Essendon West Coast. Like, 
Let, well, let's come have on. Big, to be... Let's have. Oh, do, oh no, my wife's taken out. I had the giant wooden spoon in here. Um, it, well, so we do, we're doing the wooden spoon on a feature Friday night game. Like, what? What is that about? To be fair, Swizz, all we everyone knows this simple logic. All the nuffies are out on a Friday night. <laughs> um, so yeah, they'll, they'll support them. Um, rain, hail, or shine, and and it's it's more about spectators as well. I mean. West Coast get spectators when they're up and about. If they're not performing, even even the people in the crowd were kind of disappearing. They didn't have much of a showing. So when you look at the, the main attractions, Carlton generally get a good crowd anyway. Melbourne had the success and now they have the crowds and that kind of comes with it. So Gold Coast don't, you know, like Brisbane have the success so people come, but there are some teams like Collingwood, et cetera, you give them a Friday night game and they could be not doing so well and they'll still get people there. They'll still get all of the Collingwood nuffies around the country tuning in on a Friday night to watch it. So I kind of get it. The marquee teams can get some of those better fixtures, even if they're not doing as well because people still check in. But all of those other fringe ones that don't have the same pull for prime time, definitely get them out of there. That was horrible. Yeah, but it, I guess it comes down to the general fan and that I guess how many of the Essendon West Coast will tune in versus how many of the general fan. Like, I expect, as a football supporter, like for Richmond, if they're playing anywhere in Melbourne and even probably to Adelaide, Sydney, sometimes Queensland, I'm at that game. So you can put it on any time of the day, but put it on a time that it's easier for me to get to. But I'm there, so I'm not watching. And many, I guess, supporters of the big clubs, you kind of watch Richmond's and that, they're at the games. The Melbourne support actually has probably been really low. So maybe more of them stay home or watch it or why they're up in the ski fields and, and tune in there. Um, but the general fan, it'd be interesting, like there's no way to track it, but they will know how many of the general fans are the ones that tune in on the Thursday and the Friday nights and the marquee games. Because like watching that St Kilda Port Adelaide game the other day, and there was a lot of Saints supporters at the pub we were at. Yeah, they were, that was just a disaster. And that was more because they put a game at Cairns in the middle of April, um, you know, at night. Um, so it was just too, it was just so hard to watch. But yeah, well, it's so like if, Mon- you're, if you're the summer. general fan... Monsoon tuning season. in and like what like the other night brisbane sydney like i would have been more interested to check tune in to watch that game because it's like first no second versus third you know you're gonna have dan and her first buddy um you know it's a fantastic game of footy to watch so the general fan is more likely to tune in on that than watching friggin you know last versus second last if they had that on a friday or a saturday night lots more viewers just uh, it's yeah pure pure sense anyway we digress yes, now. We can you believe that Hawthorne are actually like a dollar sixty favourites at Metricon or Marvel, whatever they Marvel Stadium yeah. against Essendon? Now I understand Hawthorne are playing better, but yeah, MCG sure, but at Metric, um, what do you call it, Marvel? Marvel. Yeah, Marvel uh, Hawks are favourites, a dollar sixty, yeah. two dollars forty, or something. I know Essendon the supporters aren't? who don't miss many games, and they're I take that one turning up this week. Stringers out as well, mate. Oh, done the other cares. hammy Stringer's four weeks. Stringer's a has-been. You know how I feel about Stringer. Yeah, I know. I know. All right, run run some players of, by me. Have we, yes. have we covered all them? What we have. We are done and done biscuits. Now, so oh. pretty much we – Clark, I'd go early on. Carol, you'd wait on. Um, Hamilton, obviously, you're waiting on. Stranatica, you'd be waiting on. Rioli, we're passing on. Paul Curtis, if you definitely – if you need a forward, go for him. Um, if you have so much that people that, and you're already looking at Clark and Carol anyway, and you've got room, then basically McComb could be your option and just hope to get lucky. Is that summarized? Yep. Perfect. All right. Let's have a look now. So paying up versus not paying up now. That's a big, this, uh, big decision. Everyone knows I love a discount. I love getting, you know, if it's free, it's me, Chris, um, shout out to quoting that since 2003. Um, Discounts are pretty much where it's at because it fills your team quicker. If you're paying, for instance, you know, we got, let's start with a midfield because that's where the points are. If you're paying for Mills and you're paying 678000 the difference between that and, say, a Petraka who's 560000 you're paying $118,000, which is pretty much one full rookie. Because remember, a rookie we consider to be successful if they make $150,000. You're pretty much then burning one whole rookie cycle in order to get in one premium against the other. And how many more points are they going to make you? So it's one of those ones where I know they're killing it, right, and they're killing it for the now. But, again, the way I see Supercoach is kind of like the stock market. 
I am not great at the stock market. I don't really have much involved in the stock market. But when you look at logistics, right, people that are on a heater, they're not going to average you 140, 150 for the season. It's not feasible. It's not possible. They want, you know, what goes up must come down and balance out, right? So there's no point in picking a player. Like Wahini, we're talking about, he's not going to average you 130 for the year, right? Possible, but highly unlikely. He'll probably then pitter back down towards 100, 105, which means that there's low games coming and you can pick him up cheaper. So same thing with Mills. So the idea is that if you're looking at a value perspective, right, you go Petraka and hope he averages you 115 to 120. Mills might average you 120 to 125 maybe, but then you kind of look at, okay, well, that $118,000, I can now get another premium a week sooner. I can, what can I do with that 118,000? I can then turn someone else into another premium and then use that. So if you look for value, what it means is that if you look for, say, two people of value, you're pretty much getting the third for free. That 118,000, another 118,000, you've now got 236,000. There you go, quick math. <laughs> and you can then put that on top of a rookie and bang, you've got yourself a premium. So you've got three premiums now instead of two. And you finish your team. So instead of playing a rookie for those extra few weeks, you are now literally locked, loaded, fully premium and kicking ass. Swizz, where do you stand on this? Yeah, mate, that's been my problem this year because I've jumped on a couple of the premiums that I was kind of happy to back in. And to be fair, they're still screwing well, but people have gone out and gone cheaper versions. Might only be two, three, five points less, but because they've put that money onto someone else, the three premiums are beating my two premiums and a rookie. And, and it's really becoming costly. Well, and my buddy captain choices on each week, that's the more costly thing. But yeah, so the value is definitely there. As I said, it only comes down to later in the year where if you have those, let's just hypothetically say, yeah, like Mills is a bit of a different scenario because I think he's more on that heater. And we see it even in games. Like how many times do the commentators say, keep that player on because when they get a player kicks a goal, Usually they can hit two, three, four goals, and we see it just momentum in footy. Happens in games, like how many players go out there three, four weeks and just kill it, and then they sort of drop off or they, um, you know, have a poor patch or whatever. Um, it, it just the way it goes. So um, Mills is a freak though, hey? I don't think I gave him enough recognition. We spoke before the air. For me, I look at Mills, and it's kind of like a, this hybrid elite premium and i don't think i gave him an up like i know last year like defender i was like oh he's doing well as a midfielder and it kind of reminds me of mccray when he went from that 108 forward you know he was a forward mid got 108 became a mid only and a lot of people sort of disregarded him and then he went on a heater like 120 he for me you kind of look at him and it's like okay well he's pretty much like a a steel a locky neal and a toque combined he's just hard he's clean he can get contested ball. He tackles like a mofo and he actually has a huge work ethic. Like it's one of those players where it wouldn't surprise me if he actually averaged 120 to 130 this year. Yeah. Which, and is I it surprising say, for you or you've been You know on the thing, because I was considering it, as I was saying, that drive up from Hobart to Launceston when I was de debating between Petrarca and Mills. My thing with Mills, I looked at that draw and said, okay, he scored like back to back like 130s, I think it was. That was against North Melbourne and West Coast. Easily the two worst teams in the competition. If he'd scored that probably against anyone else, I would have put him in. But it's just like, okay. And then Hawthorne, you know, who have been traveling really well this year, but at the same time, they're not, well, they could still make the finals, but I don't look at them as one of those top tier teams. So yeah, he went berserk that day. Um, uh, you know, a bit more data this week. And that's what I wanted to see him do it against a really good team. And what did he score? 140, I think it was. Probably got it here. One one thirty nine or something. So, um, yeah, he was. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to wait and see the the really good game because even last year to a point it was a bit up and down, a bit inconsistent, and a bit more and more like the better teams he's now starting to score. So, um, am I a hundred percent sold on him? Not yet, but I think you're right. I think he's definitely one of those guys. You know, where, and as you said, like the McCrays in the past, where they've made that jump from a different position into the midfield. And yeah, good enough to sort of go 115, 120. So he's going to be around that top eight mark, no doubt. The problem is, I think you needed, to jump, you needed to jump on earlier because we've missed those good scores. And the down patch is coming at some point for the Swans. Like they're up and about at the moment, flying, they've been winning games. 
I think at some point they're going to run into some teams, especially I think they've got the Ds coming up soon. They haven't played the likes of, you know, Fremantle, St Kilda. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a couple others. Yep. So they've got up. Gold Coast, Essendon, and then you've got Carlton, Richmond, Melbourne, Port, Saints, Essendon again, oh, that's not bad, Bulldogs, actually. Fremantle. It's not too bad. But here's the good part, though. Supercoach finals, so 19 Adelaide, 20 GWS, right? 21 North Melbourne, 22 Collingwood. Oh. So uh, oh, mate, it's possible. Didn't the Swans like the eight? How they gifted last year? How they gifted such a good draw? Um, yeah. So just pay up for him now. <laughs> I'll change my whole view on that. No, um, like, yeah, there's. I'm surprised how many actual still good games they have to play there. Because, yeah, I was looking at that thinking, well, they've played like, you know, was it the Suns and the Hawks and all that? Well, I haven't got the Suns yet, but the Hawks and North and Eagles and like how many more soft games can he have? But, you know, he's still going to score well. He's playing pure midfield. They've moved Kennedy out of the way for him. It's his midfield now. Even, you know, the park is back in there to support. But, um, yeah, like as I said, he's, he's going to be around that top eight mark. I still have more confidence in the other guys. But would it surprise me if he ended up finishing third or fourth highest? Absolutely not. No, it's one of those ones. Um, from round 19 to round 22, they only leave the SEG once as well. So that's definitely a, a nice big draw there. And I agree. It's I think all the other factors combined, I think Mills is definitely one. 678K, I'm considering it only because I don't think much of the top 500 have him. But again, one of those things is that extra 118,000, I could get a premium quicker and then fill my boots. So it's one of those ones. Um more expensive than Steele, who's 655K. More expensive than Clary, who's 639K. Both of those I'd probably prefer over Mills if you don't have him, based on a price point of view and the fact that I think those other guys will also be top eight. Now, let's talk about value. In this midfield, Petrarca, $560,000. He is definitely a nice, intriguing option. Um, anytime you get around that sort of 550 mark for a midfielder who you think can be around that sort of top eight to 10 mark is definitely good value. Now, for me, it's a little concerning. He had a little bit of a knee niggle the other week. Looked like he was pretty good um, on the weekend. But when we have a look at their draw coming up, it's definitely going to open up Swizz. Mate, I don't think it matters with Petrarca. We've seen him against the in the big games. I think he nearly prefer, he's the one more than Clary that prefers playing the bigger, um, harder teams. And, yeah, you could sit there and say Hawthorne isn't because – and that's what I've been, been saying. But at least the Hawks have been putting up a bit more of a contest. And that, and that game was a contest for quite a while. And then Petrarca just stands up, up in it where Clary seems to just absolutely beat up on the small – you know, the weaker teams. Uh, so it would be interesting to how Petrarca goes because, well, they got the Saints. So that's a big match for them. So I probably expect Petrarca to go off in that one. Um, and Clary probably being, you know, Clary is still go like 110, 120 because he's just a gun. But I think Petrarch is more likely to go that 140, 150 like he's done against the Dogs a few times in those couple of games. And then we've always seen it against the weaker teams. He seems to be the one that drops off, and then it's Clary that does more the, the dominance. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I'd Saints, still jump on West him, mate. Coast. I still think Saints, West Coast, and again. North. I think it's definitely good value. Um, yeah, it's one of those ones. I just. I like his ceiling. I don't like his floor, though. And that's the annoying part because he'll win you a week in a league or he'll lose you it. And that's the kind of thing I'm a little bit annoyed with. He has done pretty well this year, uh, 163, 129, got tagged for two weeks, which is definitely possible coming forward against another good side. 98 and 85 when he got tagged, 116, 87, 131. So he's already had two scores in the 80s, one in the 90s, but a big score of a 163 first up. So it's one of those ones where his value, and I like it, last year he absolutely came home. So once again, we have to touch on how well he finished last year. After the buys, he, uh, so from round 16, he got 123, 173, 125, 92, 148, 111, 126, and 85. Came home with a thunder, played um, GWS who were doing well, Port Adelaide who were doing well, Hawks who weren't. Bulldogs, he didn't do well against Gold Coast, tore up for a 148. West Coast scored well. Adelaide scored well. So it's one of those ones where I don't you, you mind mate, him. You've disputed everything I said before because he's absolutely dominated some of those shit teams. So He really yeah. did actually last year actually, and, and did bad, did really bad against. Yeah, and then Geelong because, he didn't do well. Essendon and Geelong he didn't do well against. Um, but it, if you're coming top of the ladder, you kind of sometimes coast. 
Yeah. That, so, oh. Well, yes and no. I think he, him and Oliver just keep pushing each other and that. But yeah, because I some of the games I've remembered him playing really well in is against some of those better teams and that. And, but he looks like more Petraka 2020 than 2021. So yeah. uh, I don't mind him. I think he's good value there. Let's move on. Josh Kelly is $542,000. If you're into some pain, can I recommend Josh Kelly, everyone? Um, look, he turned back to clock, did extremely well. He's about $40,000 cheaper than he was at the start of the year. And for good reason, he hasn't been good at all until this week. Tore it up for 153. He's been okay. Like 280s and 90, 116, 170, 106. Eh, doing okay. 153 against Adelaide. I can see him definitely tearing up West Coast, Brisbane, and North because he seems to just fancy us and those teams. So I don't really recommend him, though, for standard, though. Swizz, what do you think? I don't mind it because this is sort of what he did last year. And as I said in that Richmond game, he spent a lot of time up in the forward line. And now that Toby Green is back, I think their whole dynamic changes. And that, and it's just Kelly back in that midfield. They need him in there to win games. Um, they don't need, and if it's also they've moved Whitfield up to the half forward line. Kelly, I don't see going anywhere else, no, anywhere near that forward line. It's just go in the midfield, rack up the ball, win us games, and that. So he's, okay. I, I think he's actually good value. And and what did you'll have it there in front of you? What did he go on that heater when you got it, traded him out last year? Oh, I moved on, mate. Hmm. Um, I moved on last year. I've moved on right now. I haven't even looked at him for a second since. Um, let me bring oh, up. You want this me to tell you? I've got it here, man. I've got it. Okay, you got it. You good? You focus on him. He <laughs> killed it. He because did. It I too. know. I know you. You're trying to forget that because yeah. After I think you traded him out after like he got a 69, and then from then on he went 129, 111, 132, 102, 122, 147, 101, 103, 118, 109. So we oh, did okay. 148 and 124 after that as well. Oh, shit. Shit pick. Why would you pick him? Why would Doesn't you, make why would you want to go near the bloke? Yeah, why would you want to go near the bloke? Um, now, here's the thing. Number one is why you wouldn't pick Josh Kelly, and it's pretty simple. There's only two points in this matter. Number one, he plays for GWS and um, Cameron. Number two is they have the first buy, which is pretty much all you need to know. First buy, don't pick him. That's it. Move on. That, that's um, the issue. That is the issue. Now, Ollie Wines is the next one, $508,000. You can own... Today, ladies and gentlemen, you could own your very own Brownlow medalist, who I thought was Petrucca, uh, Ollie Wines, 508000 He has dropped $104,400, which makes him basement price, hoping the stock markets will change and turn his fortune around. Now, if they get Charlie Dixon back, they might win more games, which might mean some more points to some inside midfielders. Hasn't really set the world alight, particularly when he went off and got subbed. I think it was on... Uh, what was it, uh, 53 in yeah, round four? That's so that's still wrong. in his cycle, which is why he's pretty much based on price. He's gone only over 110 once, though. He got 118 against Adelaide, which makes sense. Big derby or big derby, uh, big game there. Otherwise, flat 100 against Brisbane, 99 against West Coast. Can't even tear up West Coast. But, you know, first game back, I guess, and 104 against the Saints. So for me... It's an interesting one. Bulldogs, I think, will be a harder one as far as inside mid, so maybe he'll lift his game a couple games back in. North Melbourne and then Geelong, Essendon, Richmond, Sydney, so a pretty tough run there for me as well. I can understand the appeal. $500,000 for a guy who might average you 110, but Ollie Wines is also notorious for averaging you shit hundreds anyway. So I'm not really big into him. I think last year was kind of this anomaly where he killed it, had a career best year. You've got the Brownlow medalist curse already written all over him. I'm not into him. I don't think he's going 110 for the rest of your Swiss. What do you think? Yeah, no, I'm not on him at all. I think it was more in one of our chats. I think it was super coach mama. She, I think she was. She was. Him. She was. I think she's big on him and that, which, yeah, what, what did you go last year? 112 in a brown low year. And that, I think like, she likes that the whole, quads, man. Yeah, it's that whole, I think, the quads, yeah. I think it's that whole Dusty thing. Like, Dusty had that one brilliant year at Brownlow, and he went, what, 119, and the rest of his career has been more that 105 guy. And Wines, like, before the Brownlow, he's gone 105, 88, and 97. Like, I know a few things changed with him, and, and you know, obviously he had that breakout last year. But, yeah, Brownlow medals, we've always said, you know, always go back after having that big year, especially if it's not like a consistent Brownlow medals, like, you know, you're five for your dainty field. If it's one of those guys, 
you know, you go back and think like, you know, your Cochins and, and, and whatnot who they have that one really big career year, um, but they haven't sort of been up that with those points every year, be, you know, before that. So I don't, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be going new wines at all. Like, yeah, there's value and we and we, that's what we're looking at, talking about value. But at the same time, I don't think there's enough, uh, the points on field, uh, just not enough value there for me. Yep. Value for value alone isn't good enough. It's the same as for picking a point of difference player just for the sake of picking a pod. Now this week, the reason why Parker is such a good buy is because he is a pretty good price, but everyone's jumping on. So if, if you're going for overall, you kind of want to get on him because everyone that's behind you is going to jump on him. Same thing with going for your leagues. A lot of people jumping on Parker. So you want to kind of negate at least some of those point of difference players, particularly someone with the caliber of Parker who can absolutely tear up a game. So yeah, I can understand. Super coach. I had a Sorry. mate sending me some fucking funny shit there. And that, that's okay. Um, that, but no, I, I agree. So I, would, um, I needed a talk. Otherwise, I'm going to keep pissing myself. I've got to stop looking at that group chat. Um, yeah, Luggy Parker, mate. Yep, go. Yep, that's okay. And I was just going to round out by saying, you know, like super coach Mama, Papa hasn't the be- had the best start to the year. And that's okay. She won 50,000 last year and absolutely nailed everyone. So. But if you are slightly behind, I can understand people trying to look for these point of difference price players and because you know if you just keep on picking all the same players that everyone else has got you're always going to be behind them so i can understand if you are ranked you know 15 20 000 and you need to kind of make some moves then maybe you're looking for some of these maybe a josh kelly someone that people don't really own who's at a basement price and hope that he averages you more than josh kelly and then that makes i mean hopes he averages more than petrarca and that makes some moves or you hope maybe you can get a wines for a 500 flat and then hope he goes 110 and then bang you can then really sort of you know, launch off those kind of players. But it is a risky business, which is why generally it's a risky play for those that are around the 20K mark to make some moves and make some inroads. Yeah. Uh, so if you are sitting around the top couple thousand, you want to play it probably a little bit safer on looking at who's the bigger trade-ins for the week, particularly quality players, and then sort of sticking true to form with the rest of the pack per se. Yep, and that's where you're 100% right there. So if you're someone nearly in my position who's dropped a bit, dropped outside the 10,000 right now, um, jumping on like a Kelly type, though I don't, as you said, I don't like his buy, unless I didn't have many round 12 buys in there and I can negate that. But that's the sort of player that would be more willing to drop, jump on or like a Zach Merritt or somebody who doesn't have high ownership, or as you were talking about Mills, um, because that is something that somebody who's got hurt factor and has shown in the past that, you know, they can go on runs and score, you know, average 120, 125. Um, and if the other rest of the competition don't have it, it's it becomes kind of the antipod not jumping on somebody that everybody else is jumping on. Hope they go don't go well and then the pod that you've got um, absolutely goes through yep. the roof. So I think those people in that situation, there's like, what are you losing by taking a risk like that? But Wines, for example, he even in his best year didn't have that. Luke Parker, because he's got that forward eligibility, I know I was chatting to Paney about this and he was asking me a few uh, few options for the forward line. I was just so big on Parker last week. And if I could have done it, um, but I was so set on getting Clary, I would have done it. And in the end, he yep. scored more than Clary and went up more and it would have worked out better going Parker. But I didn't think Parker was going 150. Me but either. How do, how do lifts, you predict that? He lifts for big games big though, games, Parker. But still he does. lifting for big games and then going 150 is <sighs> just wow. But it at hurts. the same time, yeah, he's just at that price, midfield role, swans up and about, um, and everyone is going to jump on him because Chris of was that forward eligibility. So at the moment, the 5% have done very well because most of that 5% would have jumped on him last week. Um, so you've, you're ahead of the game by a week. Um, but, yeah, if you don't jump on him this week, um, yeah, you're going to be behind, let's just say 10%, 15% jump on him. It might be even lower than that. And that, it might, and but if you don't, you're going to be behind the game. Yeah, Parker's pretty much on all the heavily trained targets at the moment. So definitely one that I am looking to get. I wish I got him last week. I was looking at him last week, but it's one of those um, scenarios. I can't say one of those things. Uh, <laughs> Chris has <laughs> definitely kissed on the dick on that one. He brought him in two weeks ago and has had 100 and 150 on his thing. And it was pretty much saying that he brought him in A on price point and he was kind of using him against uh, Heaney. And at this point in time, uh, Parker's actually outscoring Henny, so it's working out in his favor, which is pretty much what we're talking about, buying low, selling high, and that's pretty much how things are. So that's how your team value actually goes up and increases, not by just paying top dollar all the time, because then all you do is get upset as to all oh, these players like Lloyd, who's been a top 
two defender for however many years. He's someone that I wouldn't mind taking a risk on. But again, the role and how the team are performing and who they're using instead of him kind of makes him someone that you pass over, not by just someone having some bad games. It's more of a you use all of the data saying, well, Sydney's using you at McInerney. you got Blakely who when you get these guys there, they used to chip it backwards, which is probably a nice segue. We should probably quickly round off. Paddy Cripps, if you don't have him, to 526K, the easiest buy you will ever get in your life. Break even of 29, get him. That's pretty much it for that. Um, so Lloyd, right, he's 496,000. He's dropped an absolute heap. He's about 110,000 less than Stewart. So when you look at Sydney, it's like, okay, Lloyd should be an automatic. Any year that Lloyd got under 500, it's it's a no-brainer. Everyone should be trading in this guy. But, you know, McInerney and Blakely, they used to kind of kick it backwards a little bit more. So this year, though, when they're getting it to those players, they're kind of actually advancing. They're not sort of chipping around getting these junk time possessions that your Lloyd used to rack up. He's not getting the possessions that he used to get, which makes it more now role dependent and the fact on how the team's playing that makes Lloyd now kind of irrelevant. He's sort of that 90 to 100 player, not the 105 that we need. And there's a lot of defenders killing it at the moment, Swizz. They're like on 110, 105 average, absolutely the best. 13 of them that are absolutely just tearing up, which makes it even more risky to try and risk it on a player like Lloyd. So summing all that up, it's funny because um, I talked to Zane at the start of the year and I was talking about Lloyd. I had him like second for my average for the year and he was talking up Blakely and McInerney and this, that and the other. And I was like, but Lloyd. And he's like, no, nah, no, nah, they're going to be using these other boys this year. And I don't think I gave him enough credit. I kind of I had a bit of a laugh. and I'm like, oh, you know, the old faithful people that kind of a bit focus on their team and they're a little bit loopy and whatever have you. I'm like, oh, you yeah, know, that's okay. But then next minute you look at it going, fuck, mate, I should have paid a bit more attention to Zane. I picked up Lloyd, I think, in my, some of my draft leagues. I think I got him like pick 14, 15. I'm like, I'll get the best defender now. Thank you very much. Uh, hurting people, Swizz. Yeah, I'm the same. I think I picked him up in one of my drafts in the first round. <laughs> it's absolute brutal. Um, it's the sort of thing, I think, yeah, it's down to 13% now. Um, the only thing that makes me willing to touch him is because of where his buy sits, um, which is the middle buy. If he was to drop under, say, 450 and he's in under 10% of teams, maybe if Sydney were to cop an injury or something like that, then I'd be tempted to jump on because, again, that becomes a pod. We know he can score. So it becomes like if I'm – and, again, as you said, the situation, if you're further behind the pack, it doesn't matter if I fall further behind. Like what difference does it make if I finish 10,000 or 30,000? Even even the past where I think I was been in, I've been inside the, about the top 50 with about five weeks to go, I go, well, I don't care if I finish 50th or, or – you know, 10,000, I want to win the thing. So sometimes, like, that's where I'll pull the trigger and maybe go something like that because I know he can go off. But if you're up in that top sort of 100 anyway, in the middle of the buyers, the top 1,000 even, you're not going to take that sort of risk because nobody's going to take that risk. It's the ones that, you know, we're chasing the pack and if he comes in and he goes off, well, that's good for us. Um, but, yeah, at the moment I wouldn't be going near him. Yep, I think that pretty much sums it up. Now, there are a lot of other players around the low price point that I'd be interested in if you don't have them already. Stuart's 607000 which is absolutely ludicrous for me. I think it's about 30000 more than you could have bought him at the start of the year, which doesn't sound like much. But when you kind of look at generally the natural progression is everyone loses money. Right now, if Stuart was like five fifty, five sixty dollars I'd probably pay that. I don't know about you, Swiss, but 600000 for a defender, I think you just have to pass. And the problem is, is that because he had such a big score, I think it's just going up, up, and up in general, which means that you're probably not going to be able to get Stuart until the buys anyway. That real big score, same as Mills, it's in your cycle for three rounds. Then you've got to kind of wait for you to drop price again, which is going to take you at least another couple of rounds to drop price after that anyway. Um now, I'm just shaking my head, mate, because I did give some advice. That's one of the bad advice I gave on the weekend. I'm like, you don't go get Stuart. Like, there, there was a debate over, I think it might have been Clary and somebody else. I forget who it was. And th- they brought up Stuart. And I said, the the thing with Stuart, he's the he's probably got the best standard, standard deviation of anyone in the AFL. He goes 100 to 110 every week. His price doesn't fluctuate that much. And that, and you're going to still pick him up around the same price around the buyers. And then what does he do? Come out and score 187. Like, where does that come from? Like- do you know what I noticed though? The, like this week just gone more than any other week. 
So Fremantle have been really good because it's like, well, you know, it used to be, hey, rebound off the defensive line and get the run going. And now it's kind of like, well, why why wait till you get to defense? Get that forward pressure, turn it over on the wing, and then launch from there. So if you're not waiting for teams to get into the half back line anymore, you're good intercept markers, you're good users of the ball. Why are they so far back? They're kind of now wasted. So Stewart started on the wing. And I was like, whoa, what the hell's going to happen here? Right, but he just towed up short. Another person who you want people with good marking ability, good kicks, and able to actually read the play and hit those inside 50. So you used to kind of go to half back line, you try and kick it towards the wing and then sort of run and launch. Now teams are trying to, you know, like because of what Fremantle's sort of trying to do with the forward pressure and trying to turn it over at every opportunity before it even gets to the defensive line. If you turn it over around that wing period or in the midfield, if you've got short kicking inside 50, if you've got Stewart kicking inside 50, it becomes more dangerous. You're kicking deep into the 50 with short. So he was playing midfield, which then kind of provides, that's why short did really well, obviously against a bad team. So we'll talk about that another day. But Stewart on a wing, I thought it was just, abs- I was like, when I heard it, I was like, okay, this will be interesting. I wonder how he goes. But it's just amazing to see and I think some teams are sort of now transitioning to the fact like yes defenders have their role and all the rest of it but if you can turn it over sooner players like Stewart players like Short that's why they're able to get more ball than they have previously because not only that if it does go into defense then you're all of a sudden the guy who they can kick to on the way out I'm a great mark I'm a great kick hit me easy the ball comes the other way bang you can get then get it in the middle of the field and go back the other way so I think it was just absolutely genius I hate it I hate it because he's so expensive and will be now until the buys. But, um, yeah, I can see it. Short as well. Uh, loved it. Now, Short is a better price point, 532K. And the reason why is that he had a, also a big game like Stuart but had a real crap one a couple of weeks ago. So that prices him in. He's only 532000 which means that you now have an opportunity to grab him if you don't have him already. And Short went into the midfield this week. Yeah. That was a big change. So now, Dusty back. Does that change things though? Like maybe someone else can go into the midfield. I don't know. Bolton like, is he wasted? Yeah, like so what's going what, on? What? And this is the thing that I kind of got wrong with Gipkis because you know, I had a good chat about with this with painting on the weekend when we were down the cricket. Um, I, I just gathered Gipkis would go out as Floston came in, and they wouldn't change that setup because you know how many I guess tools can you have down there with like I, I thought Tarrant at some point would get pushed out anyway but when you if you've got Bolter and I thought we're too tall down the forward line Bolter goes back you got Broad um you know Grimes and then even um Vlosten can play tall short and then so how does kind of Gipkis fit in with that whole setup but they're kind of playing Broad and Vlosten more as those intercept markers play on the smalls and now with uh and with Gipkis down there and then Short's now the one that they're going to move into the midfield. And I think it's more you kind of Jack Grahams or even Shea Bolton spends a little bit time more up forward. So I think I can see Dusty coming in and rotating more with Bolton um, because they're kind of similar the way they play, more of those impact type players. So you might have like your Graham or your Cochin or one of them as your your bull inside mid. Um, and then your Dusty Bolton, your, your impact. And then Short be kind of becomes your Rory Laird type just the accumulator in there um, who kicks the ball. So, yeah, he looked really good in that first time in that role. I want to see more of it. But if he's going to be around the ball a lot or just sort of hanging off the back of packs and then, you know, kicking the ball inside 50, um, that 110 average we're picking him back at, he could be 120 from the rest of the year. I'm glad you said that because he was definitely from, I'm not sure if it was all the time, but some of the glimpses that I saw, he was the one off the back of the pack Contested players go in, get the ball, and pop the handball behind. And then, especially if you have a big kick like that anyway, you could handball it behind and you can bypass everyone. So it wasn't like he was in there trying to do the hard in and unders. He was pretty much like, hey, cool, no worries, I'm on you. And then pretty much he's at the back of the pack hoping to get that handball extraction and then bypass everyone into the forward 50. So, And how many um, teams sort of set up with that? Because well, they, they call him sort of that 60-meter player. And short who can probably kick 60 anyway. But, you know, they run 10 and kick 50. And, mm. you know, your shorts and, and Laird's been so good since that making that midfield move because they've got such a damaging kick on them. Like they've been around that halfback line for so long and you want those moments where they get forward or they get the handball from a mark 60 and they have a shot at goal. It's fantastic. 
but how much more effective can they be if you know the ball's been balled in from you know the half forward flank and they're at the back of the pack and they can hit someone 30 meters out from goal and that's what he was doing every time he was hitting lynch or trying to hit jack or um so yeah just so damaging so i can actually yep. see and just because we've got the back line players and that's where bolter did go back um so bolter's better positions at full back so i can actually see with floston and broad down there as long as there's no more injuries yeah, short kind of keeping that role. And Dimmer yeah, not only that, about it. If you're kicking inside 50, if they mark it, it's a goal assist, so there's more points anyway. Yep. In, kicking inside 50 is kind of balanced out with, you know, obviously kicking it out of the defensive 50. But generally when you're going into the 50, even then it's usually more of a contest with multiple people going up to which makes it a contested ball anyway. Now, if you're kicking out of defensive 50, it's usually kind of like a one-on-one scenario and then they might beat their opponent and intercept it. So then you kind of might actually lose points. So I think it's probably better as far as inside 50s possible goal assist to go with it and also usually more of a contested ball because you have multiple people trying to go for it. So uh, I definitely do like that. But again, price point, I think it's perfect. Zorko, 516,000 price point again over Stuart. I feel bad trying to pay. I've literally looked at it and I'm like, okay, Stuart, 607K. It uses so much money when you have all of these players here. Zorko, 516K, had 11 center bounce attendances, which was more, I think, for the first however many rounds he played. He only had like four total. So that was up a lot. He was actually, he hit the scoreboard kick two goals because he was already around that sort of forward mark anyway. Um, probably impacts, you know, with Rich as well because I think they were releasing it to Zorko previously and bypassing Rich a little bit. So I think his scoring went down a little bit. He's 510K, so he's dropped about 75,000. There's another price point of someone who could go 100 uh, as a nice cheap option there. I don't mind it, um, to be honest. And when you look at, you know, you kind of come towards the final, Zorko's someone who he's been a little bit up and down so far this year. Ceilings there definitely can absolutely towel it up. Uh, the better his, was it plantar fascia or whatever his heel goes, I think the better he gets running through that. I think that'll also improve. And he's someone who has averaged 100, 105 plus consistently anyway. And for 516,000, who probably won't be much owned at all, I don't mind that option uh, as a little bit of a risk factor. Bailey Dale's the next one. Really good buy as well for these players. 536K for Dale. Low standard deviation. Not going to really win you many games. Like, it doesn't really go absolutely ham and towel up because the dogs have a lot of accumulators. But he just gets it done. And it's one of those ones for, you know, going for standard, going for overall. He just chips away. He does his job. He scores you between 100. Uh, so between like 90 and generally about 110 and just kind of keeps chipping away. And it's kind of like death by a thousand cuts with a player like that. You know what you're going to get. He's not really going to win you or lose you a week in your leagues. But for points on field, I think Dale is definitely someone you can consider. And again, 536K. Like I know it's a bit of money to pay for a player like that. But it's not 607,000. It's not, you know, Withered and 593 who Chris brought in now has COVID. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Happy birthday there, buddy. But, you know, that that's the risk of paying up for any West Coast or, or Fremantle player. Um, that, that could be me next week. I could bring in Petrarca and then all of a sudden you have Gorn, Oliver and Petrarca have COVID and and then all the fine people at Supercoach will say, no, 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 we need more trades yes. because these players are too important for Melbourne. Um, and even Doherty, 562K. So it's like, well, you, do you want to pay and put up and, you know, put all your investment, all your equity into one sort of basket or can you pick off these cheap players when they rise and back them in to kind of improve? Now, there's one that more that you want to talk about there, um, Swizzy, a North Melbourne folk, yeah, 420,000. Like talking about North Melbourne folk, and traditionally I don't like having North Melbourne folk in my team, but there is one guy at 420,000 who went up 18,000 this week, break even of 45, and – Ignore his early scores where he went that. Well, he start, first round went 140 and a few jumped on him. And that, then he had that 28 against your boys. But since Aaron yeah. Hall's injury, Luke McDonald, 101, 76, 102, 98. So he is their man around that half back now. He's got to kick the ball. And we, everyone was talking about it anyway. And I think everyone got gun shy because of that 28 against Brisbane. But Hall was still in at that point. And even against the doggies, where before Hall went out, um, he had the semi, the seventy six. But most of those points, I think fifty of them were in the second half when Hall went out. So pretty well marked since Hall's gone, he's averaged right on a hundred because ninety eight, one hundred two, and then the fifty second half. So yeah, 
It's 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 just what he does. It's not going to be like the hundred and tens that some of the other defenders, but it's the value, and that's where we're talking about value there. Where yes, you could pay up for a five seventy guy, Doherty or Witherden or whatever, who's more likely to go that one ten. But at four twenty for a guy that looks like going to be a flat hundred guy, um, there is a lot of value there. Definitely a lot of value. Now, uh, we spoke extensively after the Brisbane game about this. It's because Brisbane had so many dynamic and explosive small forward types that he had to play more accountable. And Aaron Hall was very similar. So you had like Charlie Cameron, you had um, – oh, I've got a complete mind blank now. Um, yeah, I'm thinking Geelong. Oh, yeah, from I, Geelong. I thought you were talking about the Brisbane uh, – um, uh, Lincoln McCarthy. Lincoln McCarthy, thank you. I can't believe I had a mind blank there. Your own players, but, mate. <laughs> yeah, I know, mate. It's literally there's no, so many good, good players in my team. You can't even just think about them. Um, but these kind of players, um, that's why I had to play a little bit more accountable. So when I'm when I'm looking at McDonald, I'm like, okay, well, which kind of teams have these small forwards that are going to be so damaging and so um, risky to kind of play on that you need to play accountable? So maybe Melbourne. Yeah, but, you know, Fritsch, you kind of, he's more of an intercepting player. Uh, Cozzy, you'd probably give someone else that job anyway. Port don't have it. Fremantle don't really have it. Um, St. Kilda probably do have some sort of small forwards, but again, do you know what I mean? They probably go for more of those tall timber sort of types. Gold Coast are a shamble. GWS are the same. Adelaide, you probably, I reckon I'd back him in over some of those other younger because a lot of the Adelaide forwards are younger. Geelong, again, Key forwards there, so not really. It's it wouldn't be his opponent, so he'd probably go on one of those other and types and try and absolutely got hundred against them. Actually, he would, exactly. He but was do you know what I mean? So when you when you look at those small forwards and those damaging sort of lead up marking yeah. and also hit the ground types, it's maybe only like Richmond, Collingwood, maybe that might yeah, actually no, do a bit I think of damage. You're on the money there, and St Kilda as well. I like Higgins Butler. Yeah, you said them, but um, yeah, they're the ones. So outside of that, I think he's pretty safe option. As I and said, for a don't, league. Don't expect if you're not going overall, then it's great. Don't it, and even still, don't expect like the 110s. But as I said, if you well, as you said about where can you put your money for like some people are talking about what to do with kind of day costs at the moment, and because I think he like he's around that mark, what he's averaging break even about 75, 78, and, and tapped out at 378. And if you think Luke McDonald's going to play every, well, should play most games. And that bar, uh, you know, injury or whatever. So, and he's locked in that back line there. Be- the guy coming out of half back who's going to average a flat 100, and it's only 40K to go Dacos up to him. Yeah, it's not a bad option. No, I'm with you on that. And not only that, Dacos had that 125 against West Coast, which really did pump his scores. But when you look at Collingwood, Richmond, the Dogs, Fremantle, Carlton, Hawks, Melbourne, that's a pretty tough run. Like for anyone, let alone a, you know, a young player that's an accumulator and you don't really get the space all the time to kind of really accumulate. Um, that is a tough run. That's probably about as tough of the next six games as anyone. And Collingwood definitely have a tough six games coming up. So uh, I'm hoping he lasts to the buys, but I'm not adverse to kind of trading him if I need to. That's defensive line. Now let's talk about forwards. Forwards are real simple. Right, Tommy English, 572K. He's probably one of the more expensive forwards you will get outside of Dunkley, who we assume that you would actually own at this point in time. Otherwise, what are you doing with your life? (laughs) And we did say Dunkley had that hurt factor when you bought him in and brought him in, brought him in and also paid for him, so bought as well. He, based on the hurt factor and his high ceiling and the fact that, you know, he was played in the midfield during the preseason and everything, he's killing it. 118 average, that's what you paid for. That was the risk that you took. Now, English is 572K. If you don't have him or you traded him out, I think it's worth just watching him for a couple of weeks, see how his hammy goes. Hopefully that break even goes up a little bit, then you can get him a little bit cheaper. But he is worth the price. He's the number one averaging ruck. Also, the was it second averaging forward? I'm not sure based on, I think Dunkley might be now beating him or or could be vice versa. But that's the price you pay, and that's okay. And the forwards are so cheap anyway. Compared to the defensive line, you don't have to risk it. You don't have to pay 607000 for a Stewart. You don't have to have a COVID with it and for 593 k Literally, I'd rather spend my money in the midfield because you know what you're getting. Forward line's cheap, man. Heaney, 535K still. If you don't have Heaney, go there. Parker, 518K, so cheap. Go there. Duncan, 448K, so cheap. Fuck off, Duncan, you shit. <laughs> Hurting me in all these draft leagues. 
Still someone I'm looking at. I can't believe Duncan can play that badly for the whole year. Surely. Swizz, is it his role? Like, surely his role, I think he's playing more defense. He's not getting on the wing, not getting the accumulation, not kicking inside 50 with his good boots. I don't know what's wrong with him. Well, I think that, well, there's a bit of that. Um, And it's just, I guess, we talk about players and I guess they hit, you know, a certain age and, it just, you know, hits different players differently. And and Geelong have been a little bit up and down in form as well. He's coming back from that injury. Um, you know, that all of those factors come into it. Some players, yeah, it just, you know, for whatever reason, they hit that moment and, um, yeah, they just can't find find their form back. Like, he obviously been a quality player for so long, but he ne- now is over that 30-year bracket. And in some of those players, they do. They hit 30 years old. That's oh, I just can't believe how done. bad he is. Yeah, and um, Tom Engli- it's uh, sorry, Tom. Tim English is the number one yeah. averaging forward and ruck. So that's why. And for five seventy k, I that's money well spent. To we be do. honest, actually, just one quick one. I just had a mate message me, Ray, good old Ray, and that he was just uh, he was actually down at uh, where was he tonight? Dandy Skate Park with Adam Trelaw. Um, shout out to Adam Trelaw was doing uh, free meals and everything for uh, some of the people down at Dandy Nong. So just that one came through in my messages and that so. Great work Wonderful. There for, for, for young Trelaw. Hopefully, uh, shout out, yeah. shout out to Trelaw. I'm surprised um, Ray messages you at night time, mate, because um, I thought he was more of a daytime chat person. I'm not, I'm not going to touch that at all. I'm not going to touch any comments <laughs> about Ray, actually. But um, yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's a nice little daytime pun. Um, Duncan, he's mate, he's so um, bad. He's yeah, got a break even, break even of 127. This guy's going to be 400 thousand. And I still don't want to touch him. And he's someone that could have been one of the highest averaging forwards. And he's completely dropped off a cliff. Uh, uh, it's mate? frustrating. He's 30 in some plays. It just happens. They get injuries and they just like. He shouldn't it, be that bad like, though. He's mate, a 90 at, like, at minimum player. Mate, I watch, I watch Koch these days and, you know, he keeps trying and everything like that. But it's just the way it goes. Some players, they do. like well, Compared to like Buddy, Buddy looks like he can play another five years. Come on, he's an absolute superstar and that but yeah some players and they just hit that moment and for whatever reason their body just says no nope, i just can't do it anymore and that, interesting so. um someone i am trying to watch at this point in time jordan Ngoi, 473k after the gastro and everything like that he had a couple of down games break even of 139 so if he goes low 400s he's definitely someone that could intrigue me um, but again, it's Jordan Degoe, so I don't know if I, I have enough room for flogs on my team. Uh, if anyone, if I do want to flog, I'll probably go Sicily, and um, I think Jordan Degoe and Green can hold off. Um, the one that we do want to talk on is Darcy Cameron. Now, I spoke about him last week uh, behind closed doors because it was one of those ones where I was like, oh, you know, the injury news came out. I spoke to some mates, and I was like, hey, he had a break even of about a 95. And I was like, Darcy Cameron is a ruck. Uh, scores shit as a forward, but Darcy Cameron as a ruck is definitely someone that intrigued me. His break even was high enough that I was like, right, let's just, I'm going to scrap that thought at all and move on to next week. And he comes out right now. When we talk about him being a crap forward, basically it was, you know, 19, a 72, 50, 37, 55, horrible. Now, super coach, again, we speak about, it's all about role. The role you have, the position you play pretty much determines how well, yeah, obviously you being a good player plays a big part of that, but the role gives you opportunity to score well. He scored 115 against the Gold Coast, which is no mean feat because Wits has been monstering a lot of rucks this year. So for me, that's actually a pretty decent outcome. Richmond, the Dogs, Fremantle, Carlton. So the next three are probably a little bit harder. Richmond, Dogs, and Freer, a little bit harder. Carlton, you know, have an easy ruck. Hawthorne have an easy ruck. Melbourne, obviously, <laughs> good luck to you. GWS have got Proust. And then they play GWS again. North, Adelaide, Essendon, all having issues at the moment. Uh, well, not all having issues. So North Melbourne should have Cherry and stuff by that point in time. But for someone who's a ruck, average, uh, he's 330K. He did well this week. You could do a lot worse than getting a guy. He's a forward who will get ruck eligibility probably in the next cycle. 330k for someone who could go close to 100 in that ruck position, Swiss. Is it? Are we unrealistic to think, hey, it's pretty tempting? 
Mate, I had Abdul message me saying, whatever you do, do not mention Darcy Cameron this week because there's 234 people with him and he wanted to be the 235th and just wanted him to fly under the radar. And I was like, that is not fucking happening. And that, um, yeah, the, I don't like the price as much because it is 330, but God, I love the role. And we keep talking about Ruck's walkout with 80. And he's not just your normal, normal Ruck who's sort of, you know, we talk about the Hazers and those guys coming in. He, like Proust, has been in the system, probably not as long as Proust, but not far off it. So he's mature aged. Uh, I think he was originally at Sydney before he moved to Collingwood and, and did his apprenticeship behind Grundy. So very similar to Proust, who you know did his apprenticeship behind Goldie and, and Gorn. Um, so, yeah, he's got all the, the, the right standing there. Um, and, yeah, look, you know, we know, like, with that run, there's no reason why he couldn't go sort of 100 for those weeks and that and, A, make cash. And, like, Grundy's a big chance not coming back this year. So you're talking about the guy who's going to be the number one rock at Collingwood. Kruger's out as well. So there's no backup there. Like, they've brought Beg in. But Beg, as much as he's probably more that ruck, he, he's playing forward at the moment. But I don't think they're going to go with him. And the only other one possibly is Mason Cox. Now, Mason Cox did absolutely tell up my cousin in the VFL this week. Shout out to Adam. But um, tough little game. They actually, he's been copying it. I think he's come back from injury and he copped Flynn and Briggs one week and then he copped Darcy Cameron. So um, hopefully he gets actually to play against just a VFL ruck for once. But, yeah, Cox had a great game. But Cox, what's he now? 31, 32. He's not the future of Collingwood. Um, and well, and everybody knows about Mason Cox. As I said, if he's coming in, he's probably playing forward. Like They're not going to play Mason Cox as Salt Ruck. At best, they're giving him like maybe a 20% chop out. So they've recruited Darcy Cameron for this moment. He's there on the list in case break, break glass. If Grundy goes down, Grundy has gone down. They've got a ready-made Ruck who can come in and do what Proust is doing and go 105 each week. So a 330K for a guy who's in your forward line who could average 105 for the next eight, nine weeks, it's very tempting not to jump on. I'm yeah, no, I'm with you. Jump on. Yeah. yeah. It's one of those ones, but like I, I can see the logic in it. I'm not sure if I have the balls to pull it off, though, to be honest. I mean, I, I've got balls, but I don't mm. know if I can do that. For 330K, you know, it's – the difference between paying an extra 150000 to try and get an actual player who you'll have a little bit more confidence in. So it's that's the kind of price point. It's When you're at the start of the season, if he was a ruck player, even then you kind of go, well, Gresham was three hundred k and it took him a little while to actually make any money. So uh, I don't know. Uh, the role definitely says that there is an option there. He scored, I think in 2021, he scored multiple 100-plus scores with a 120, et cetera, in there. So it's definitely not ludicrous. My, I'm my kind play, of watching him. My One of his break even low. Yeah, my play on this, because I'm still committed to Parker and getting Cripps back in my team, is I want to see one more week. If he, what's his break even? 45. So if he scores 100, he's going up 27. Oh, he's got to go 105 to go up 27K. And that. So the hopefully, and if he did that, then it starts making me think, well, you know, he's on a bit of a roll here and stuff. But that still only puts him at 350 which if, say, maybe a Dixon, um, you know, it, it might be only 100,000 on Dixon and that who's in my forward line. So Dixon, who's my, you know, F sort of eight at the moment, and that if I could put 100K on him, Darcy, and Darcy could be my F7 loop or my F6 going forward, um, it's probably not a bad option, but then at least get another week. I'm happy to pay an extra 20K to see it then going maybe this week because there is that possibility what happens if he did drop. Like as we say, Rucks will walk on the field. He'll score 80 this week. But if it's a flat a flat 80 compared to a dominating another 105, 110, the 105, 110 makes me really think going, now this guy is just another Proust. And then I've got confidence. And the other thing, coming into those buy rounds, they're going to have the second uh, position changes, which means he will get Ruck status. And those who are like me, who are carrying Proust, and you might not have the money for English and you want that extra backup, well, that could become handy to have Cameron in your forward line, F6, F7, who can be your R3 and cover for one of your rucks. Yep. I spoke about it on my team podcast last week as well. I pretty much said, hey, I pretty much got Cameron in every draft league that I could based on role, based on the fact that he's older and this was his now moment to shine. 
as a forward and getting that dual durability later on, I think it's definitely worthwhile. And I put him on field. I put him on field over Lockie Weller and all these other players just based on his role. And I got rewarded. I think I got him. I think I'm in four, four. I think I'm in five draft leagues, and I got him in four draft leagues. No one paid any attention to him. No one gave him any kind of credit at all. And I think these are the kind of players that when an opportunity arises, you need to be quick enough to jump on. Yeah, that's pretty yeah, much it's all about opportunity. To that because my good mate, Lukey, one was out there. Saturday night was going the crow over our the mate, Doggy. And I think you were responding to Doggy the other day on the group, on the uh, Facebook page, um, where about beating him in a league. He had Darcy Cameron and benched him, Lukey, and ended up losing his um, his draft match by about 20 points in the end. And we were just like, you friggin' flog. He's like, oh, well, Darcy Cameron's been scoring 50 fights. Not as a rock, you idiot. So, uh, yeah, not only did you go the early crow, but you fucked up big time there, Lukey boy. Man, it's, I had a big there's one. A, there's a comment that we have. It's a oneless. And, yes, Lukey, it is a oneless. Oneless. This will round us up anyway. So thanks everyone. Um, <laughs> in draft leagues, if you score over two thousand, that's pretty much a big, big week. Now we usually play like eighteen players with the bench and all the rest of it. This week, I absolutely just towed up in three of my draft leagues. I got two thousand and seventy, which is probably my biggest score ever. Two thousand and sixteen. Actually, no, sorry, I lie. 2,139 I got in one of mine uh, against um, Spills. So the guy on YouTube, Spills on YouTube. Man, I literally was just dominating. A lot of my picks just went absolutely ham. And, um, yeah, I can't complain with that. And I'm pretty sure that Spills one doesn't even have a captain uh, in the in that mix. So, um, yeah, it's just one of those things. Uh, one of those things, transition swiz, mate. I've got to stop. I've got to need electric shock on that. But that does wrap us up. That's pretty much your rookies for this week and next week. I hope we've given you enough coverage on you know defensive line, midfield, and forwards. The difference between paying the extra eighty to one hundred thousand dollars and then using that value to actually free up that cash to get you another premium elsewhere. Um, it's really the time from now until then. I'd probably go aggressive for another two weeks, particularly with those trade boosts. This week, next week, I think you could be extremely aggressive. From that round 10 and 11, you're pretty much close to the buy rounds where it's best to kind of maybe downgrade rookies who aren't on your field if there's someone that really presents and then kind of just shore yourself up to then launch again for that round 13 and 14 in particular. That's what the strategy should be. You've still got, I think, Swiss, what do you reckon? You've still got a couple weeks to go super aggressive at worst, I think you can go this week, next week, aggressive. If you have a lot of cash built over, you could probably go one more upgrade for that round 10. If you have someone that you set your mind on and you've got the cash, there's no point sitting on cash for three rounds. Um, that round 11, that round 12 period, you pretty much should just be downgrading, freeing up that cash to assault. So if you want premiums, go aggressive this week, next week, and possibly round 10, more if you have cash in the bank and you want to actually invest that. So for instance, next week, there's about three rookies you could be able to get. If you don't go this week and you have your plan set, you can almost triple downgrade next week. Round 10, I'd actually use that money to get a premium at least and then show up your, your your trades and your strategies and work out your buy structure. Look at, oh, shit, maybe I didn't realize how many buy players I had this week or whatever. You know, you should be really doing that. If you don't know your buy splits, you need to look now. How many do you have? Because I know Whitfield, who I keep holding for some stupid reason, He's probably the issue I'm holding too many buy plays for that first buy round, which isn't my strategy, but you need to know. And if you don't know, you need to know so that way you don't bring in any more nuffies from the same buy round that you're already having issues in. Any final thoughts, Wiz? Uh, no, mate. It's, oh, actually, no, I do, I do agree with you with a lot of that. It's it's the thing that you see a lot of the top teams, they have been aggressive. Now, those who are waiting, who are hoping for their uh, – the COVID outbreaks, and I, I do see that pop up in some group chats. I'm saving my trades and stuff like that, which I do get, but it kind of becomes a bit like the, the housing market in a way. Well, I'm, you know, I'm waiting to buy because I'm hoping the market drops or interest rates go up and stuff like that. Unfortunately for people who like me who wouldn't mind a bigger house than that, it's just fucking never happening. And and that, and that I'm sure at some point it will, and I'm sure at some point some of these teams get COVID and you be, beauty those who have held their trades but you could find a situation this might not happen until sort of around 17 18 and by then like especially if you're league players you're too far behind the pack there so if you're in particular league player 
um, you need to start getting a bit more aggressive and using some of those trades and trade boosts. And I saw someone the other day, so oh, I haven't used a trade boost. I'm like, yeah, but you're like behind you, you're sitting down the bottom of your leagues. And I know one league I'm in, it's just super aggressive where we've got people who are nearly down in their teens for trades and use sort of three, Ooh. four, absolutely so aggressive. But then you look at their teams and that's what I was saying with like Abdul's. It's like, you know, they've got Clark at M at M9 because they've got eight primo mids in the midfield. So that's what you're coming up against in leagues each week. And you're just getting smashed because these guys are just, you know, you, their primo mids are coming up against your rookies. So you've got to have a little look at that, the sort of your matchups in your leagues, um, if you are a league player, or also if you're just a, um, you know, a ranking player, you've got to have a look at kind of where you're sitting. So if you're sitting pretty up near the top, great. You can hold on and make some more decisive uh, moves. But if you're down, you know, or you're dropping your rank, well, then you do need to get aggressive and maybe take some risk and then hope that, you know, that COVID outbreak doesn't happen. Yeah. And the funny thing is that with the seven day quarantine or whatever it is, you could still be infectious after that. Everyone's like, Oh, seven days bang out in the community. Go. You could still be infectious in that period. So it's, it does concern me with Melbourne at the moment. I've already got Gorn and Oliver. Do I really want to bring in another player when there is definitely COVID going on in Melbourne? If there's no news of an outbreak between now and game day, then I'll probably leave it. If there's more that actually break out then, then I think for me, Petrarca probably has to like probably just, I don't need that risk um, and go elsewhere. The other thing is that I don't know what your answer is. I've got 26 trades before this round, so I'm probably going to burn a few this week. Um it's one of those scenarios where I'm with you on the fact that you can save it for a rainy day, but then you might end up in a drought season and never spending it. My question is though, if you get to the point where if you, do you have to use those extra trades in a boost or is that just there to allow you five options to actually go the extra trade? Because if you use your two trades per week, for 18 weeks or whatever it is, you could still go, well, you know, well, not 18, well 35 trades. Do you have to use the extra one in a boost or does it just 35 trades in total and you have five options to use a boost to access one of those earlier? Because what happens if you have five trades, do you have to use those? So, you know, 30 no, trades because, to 35 trades. Because the season's 23 weeks, mate. So 23 times two is 46. So, yeah, no, no, you don't have yeah. that. I'm saying as in the, so you have 35 trades, yeah. right? So it used to be 30. They go, yeah. hey, we'll give you 35 trades yeah. and you have five trade boosts. Yep. Yeah. No, no, you don't have to use them boost. So you could just use okay, two yeah. a week, and that for sure. Like, if, yeah, and if you that, just that don't use sense. your boost, you don't use. I know because I was like, well, yeah, okay, no, that makes sense. Because I was like, that'd be really harsh otherwise. If you yeah. have to use those extra five trades in a boost, that'd be really messed up. Anyway, I've got a, a guy at school's already used three trade boosts, and he's like, hey, I might have to use another one. I'm, <laughs> so, mate, you know, I'm in that position where I'm tempted to use my fourth this week. Yeah. Oh, you have you you've used three. Yeah. And I'm still getting freaking destroyed. And I'm getting destroyed because my captain. How do you find out how many boosts you've actually used? I think I've only top, used. Hang on, let me. Yeah, well, hang on. Mine just says three crosses because I'm I've got my yeah, trades locked in for the week. This week. Yeah. Close. I've got four trade boosts left. Fucking hell. Three three probably and after this week. They're on top of the rankings. Stop. Yeah. Fuck you well, and your rookie roulette and your captain picks each week. That's literally hey, the Gorn, difference between Gorn, you and I. Gorn was one week in oh, a VC mate, and, and you had the, Gorn. All I, year you didn't use him. I went out <laughs> in the worst All thing year. Is, I went out. I did the toss in cricket on the weekend and that I've walked off and I've gone, I've just got this funny feeling about Oliver. Let's just change that. And then I walk out in the field and then come off after the game. I'm like, well, I don't know, I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, and, then I'll you know. and then I'll stitch you up because thanks for the fucking shit advice on Sunday. I was like, oh, what did I'm, I say? Think, I'm thinking Dunkley, oh, yeah. I'm thinking Neil, I'm thinking Took, I guess McRae. And you were like, oh, no, you've got to go McRae. you got to go McRae, Captain. I'm like, oh, I think you make a good point, Ben. And then I'm like, I said McRae was probably the most logical based on whatever <laughs> and also be going with. And again, that is completely unbiased <laughs> opinion, thanks, Wiz, because I already had a great VC. So it wasn't <laughs> no. like it was a biased oh, no. I option. I was like, what you stitch me up here and I couldn't get over my bias against Essendon like oh well McRae's going to smash them because Essendon is shit so well, McRae and Essendon don't tag but McRae is just not McRae like <sighs> now the issue was is that Mills we thought would probably tag um, Neil which kind of worked out except the fact that number one Neil absolutely had a blind eye like tore shit yeah. up the second one is they kind of like went high five and both actually went really well so it wasn't quite the dangerous lockdown Neil 
over the progression of the last three years, and this is off topic, which we'll finish off here anyway, Neil has completely transformed. Anytime someone gives him any attention at stoppages, he's literally a little bit of push and then starts running. You can't hold at that point. Mm. Do you know what I mean? You, once he uh, he's there and like, okay, a little bit of push shove and then the ball's up and he starts running. He has literally worked out and by getting all the attention that he had for many years, he's someone now that can't really be tagged completely like he used to. Yeah. Him running in stoppages is literally the reason that he just kills it and he continues to kill it. And then he on, when he's on the move – if the ball's in his vicinity, he's like awesome, or he transitions onto the next phase. And because he's already run past you because you're trying to negate him, he then becomes an option. So it's just absolutely brilliant. Watching him now with attention is absolutely brilliant, and I could not speak more highly of him. Great guy, not as great as Zorko, but if I knew him, I'm sure I'd offer him a coffee. Final thoughts, Wiz, that's it? Yeah, mate, that's it. And happy Zuba coaching and check out our uh, weekly pods and that. Thank you all yeah, for Yeah, when are support. you doing yours? Um, most likely, what are we today, Choose I, you know what, because there's no Thursday night game, there's a big chance I might do it Thursday night again, because it's kind of good doing it with the teams. And I know it's a bit late for people because some people like to, you know, get their extra couple of days to listen, but I did and must admit, did enjoy talking about the teams, uh, the Q and a posts I'll put out again. So, um, I do try to spend most of the time instead of talking about my team, but just answering people's questions, um, um, thank you to a couple of people who have actually been posting that on different forums if you've got any questions for me to answer. And, you know, it's, it's beautiful, like, to sit there and just, you know, try to help people out. And, beautiful. Yeah, so we'll go from there. There you go. You heard it here. Swizz is pretty much SC Insiders community bitch. Yeah. Uh, here you go. <laughs> all yeah, the, mate, uh, I, like, and I, I mean, all like, the I'll, I'll talk myself up. I give great advice. I just don't oh, fucking do. take my stupid advice on that. You do give extremely good advice, <laughs> and the difference is that you're in you're in a set scenario, but then we usually soundboard off on yeah. the other scenarios. And Chris Chris does have his benefits as well. Yeah, he's got some um, sort of benefit. Well, I guess. Chris kind of sold me on Brody, and I wasn't really keen on. Chris yeah. sold me on keeping Nod when I was thinking about do I get rid of Nod or do I get rid of um, whoever else it was. I think it was Rochelle. Yeah. and um, yeah, I probably could have got rid of Mc, McDonald, but anyway. So yeah, yeah. No, and, and I love that's, that. that's that's yeah, where communities that's are great. And that's, and that's what I've done, mate. I convinced someone to get rid of Gro Grundy. I've convinced people to get Parker this week, convinced people to get Nod and Bowie and that, and I've done none of those freaking things. But, you know, those people I've convinced, one guy messaged me this week, he's like, oh, it's good 2,600. How did you go? And I'm like, don't fucking talk Not good. to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Parker was the difference between me going 2,600 and 25, yeah. so – um anyway that's it from us everyone so i'll probably try and do my teams now just because i don't know what the end of the week looks like so while i'm here and on the stream i might do my team so check that out as well that's it from us chris will be with us next week with some awesome news obviously about our new sponsor get amongst it we'll touch in depth on that next week swiss um word of the week we'll go uh uh let's go in actually no let's go um um stormtrooper Word of the week. Yep. For those who are still listening of... to us right now. Mate, there are. There's some very dedicated people there. Yeah, and we love, the, we love we the pineapple. We had so many the pineapples. Fucking pineapple. And the Holy pineapple shit. memes. Oh, they were fucking oh, awesome. Mate. Re absolute respect to our fucking This is This is definitely gone. Mate, we've spent 20 minutes going off track here, but I love <laughs> it. Now, the pineapple thing, I... It's funny though, right? Because Chris, it's, Chris and me and, and Swizz obviously came on last year, and he's been a revelation that we can't get rid of because he's fucking amazing. Swizz, we love you. The sometimes you forget, right? Because Chris and I, we just like, man, we speak so much footy, and we're like, oh, maybe we should just like get together and record our thoughts. And we had some, we were like, oh man, we had like a hundred listens. Like this is fucking crazy. People listen to us and all the rest of it where they were in the world. Now it's at a point where people actually inbox us like, yo, when's your fucking podcast out, <laughs> or when are you recording, or like asking us questions which we can't always get to. And the fact that we're like, oh, yeah, obviously a little bit of a drunk kind of incoherent sort of, you know, oh, like, hey, pineapple. And obviously the, the key word for, um, we won't go there again, but anyway, for the coitus. Um, anyway, <laughs> so the, and the amount of pineapple, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, pineapple comments, pineapple gifts, this and the other, like rows of pineapples. I'm like, literally, I probably have never felt more loved like reciprocal kind of loved and embraced because when we do this, it's like it's Swizz and me talking footy. And I know people listen to it and comment, which we love the comments, but you kind of don't really get the grasp of reality on how many people actually listen or actually appreciate or tune in weekly to then actually go out of their way and spend time to comment and send us pineapples 
And I was fucking blown away, Swizz. Like, I, Mate, and, and, there's not many times that you're blown away. And, and as I said to you boys, it really got me one day. I had, um, because for those who know, I'm, I drive trains. So here in Melbourne. And um, people can hear, obviously, well, some people hear if you're not listening to music, make announcements and stuff like that. And obviously, whatever, somebody's recognized my voice. And as I've got out of the train, come up and gone, oh, you're that bloke from Supercoach Insider, rah, 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 and ask me a question, Supercoach, and I tell you what. And that, apart from my colleagues, just gave me so much shit about that. But uh, it was just fantastic to know that there's people out there who, yeah, do listen and, lo- and love hearing us. And yeah, that that whole pineapple thing. So yeah, see what you can come up with for Mate, stormtroopers or <laughs> this week. Just it's a it's got a, the, it's, uh, a, it's, a, it's a tight <laughs> it's a tight knit unit. There's a VP, vice principal. Right, and they love their super coach, mate, which is awesome. So we're chatting there, and I'm like chatting there, and you're giving them advice on which rookies or whatever, you know, when they have time because they've been swamped, they've been flogged the last couple of years with COVID and all the different changes that admin have to do, and it's crazy. And it's funny because I remember a couple of years ago, I'm chatting to one of them, giving him advice, and he's like, "Wait, you know, one of the other ones, one of the other VPs who also plays super coach is like, hey, what are you doing? Don't be giving him advice." He's like, oh no, we're talking behavior management. And he's like, "Bullshit." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, listening to that, um, I think because the first two years I was there, I kind of coached someone into winning, you know, the the premiership or the the school cup. So, and even then, like you have now students that you kind of don't talk to, and they're like, "Oh man, yeah, play Supercoach year 12s, obviously, because you know they're they're the cool ones playing Supercoach." But um, yeah, so that's pretty much a nice reality check. But no, thank you everyone that does like comment and shout out. And if you do send us a message and we don't always get to it, that's just the nature of running a life and having a hobby. And uh, but we do really appreciate it and blown away, love it, absolutely love it. This has gone on way too long. <laughs> well, nice I'm going to round 15. it up because I'm, I've got an early start tomorrow. No, mate, I know. Yeah, you do. I've got to do Melbourne my team work, thing here, but... mate. I've got literally. I've got. Um, I'm on baby duty, mate. So <laughs> I'm literally the missus working night shift. Baby's halfway sideways. It's okay. She's asleep, not making noise. But um, yeah, appreciate yeah, think, you, everyone. Thank I you. Think, Thanks, Chris. Yeah, no, I think we're about the seven a.m. Tomorrow train, so yeah, you know, I got to get some you, sleep and get those people get to work tomorrow. So yeah, oh. it's uh, you know, it's, what's it's, what's your train voice sound like, Swiss? Oh mate, my train voice is terrible as all. That it, it, it's just this, mate. It's just as I normally speak. It's deep, friggin' husky voice. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you know, definitely well, sound like you could be in a rock band oh, for sure. Couldn't, mate, couldn't I? I, I feel <laughs> like that. I, I sound like I'm just on this never-ending bender. And that, which it probably has been for the last week because obviously my birthday week just seems to expand longer and longer every week. But yeah, no, it's, oh, I oh, as you said, I love doing this, mate. This is great fun talking footy with you. So yeah, happy super hey, coaching this fun. week, guys. And even better when people listen to it, just popping off the numbers. Love it. The fact that we're actually, you know, eventually once Chris gets the mail to be able to actually cash out some of this YouTube thing, it'll be great as well. Gets, you know, Swizz some new stuff. We'll get Chris a new mic. We'll then be able to reinvest and do all sorts of real cool stuff, which we're excited for. But um, look, catch us next week. I'll probably do my team podcast now. Swizz Thursday night for team. So get on there. Swizz, what's your YouTube again? I mean, your Twitter? Uh, It's Swizz. Swizz Swizz 26. Swizz 26. If you have a question for Thursday's teams, hit out Swizz on Twitter. We're pretty much all very active on Twitter because we're old folk and Twitter's the best place to get information. Uh, Facebook messages and stuff do come through as well, so thanks for that. And YouTube, we're definitely really, really active on YouTube because YouTube just pops off with questions and stuff like that as well. So anyway, however you are, get us there. Anyone that's listening on the audio platforms, come check us out on YouTube. Like, subscribe, look at our awesome faces. You get to see us in person whenever you can. So check us out. Swizz wearing the Employee of the Month shirt. Uh, That's it from us. We'll catch you next time. And uh, until then, may your teams be hashtag blessed, and we'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Bye.